Hello, and welcome to the second installment of the Expanding Research Partnerships webinar series. My name is Peter Grandello, and it is my pleasure to serve as the moderator for today's webinar. The presenters and topics are, Mr. Sakela will present on the topic, NIOSH's Video Exposure Monitoring System, Helmet Cam, an innovative tool for assessing workers' exposure to respirable dust and other contaminants. Dr. Keefe will present on the topic, Reducing Logging Fatality, and non-fatal trauma incidence rates with new real-time operational GNSS, RF communications, recommended safety procedures, and education. Some housekeeping reminders. This webinar will be conducted using Adobe Connect software, hence the audio will be coming from your computer speakers or earphones. If you require some technical assistance from Adobe Connect, please call one 800 422-3623. This webinar is being recorded and we plan on posting a copy of it in a few weeks. You can find a copy of the uh, web, li web link uh, immediately below. Live closed captioning will be made available in Adobe Connect. If you require an unedited transcript, please email us at dwilliams24 at cdc.gov. Our third installment of this series will be held on November 14th. Additional information for this webinar will be posted at www.cdc.gov slash NIOSH slash OEP. A brief moment to acclimate people to the Adobe Connect windows. The large main window towards the upper left is the primary window for our presentation. Going counterclockwise, the closed captioning viewer window will stream live captioning during this presentation. The file download window provides participants an opportunity to download a PDF copy of today's presentation. Q&A window. In today's webinar, we will only take written questions through the Q&A window. When asking a question, please provide the name of the presenter to whom the question is being asked. And please do not include abbreviations or acronyms in your questions. Finally, in the upper right-hand corner, we provide additional notes for attendees, including information for technical link and a link for live closed captioning. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Feltner, who is the Associate Director for Research Integration and Extramural Performance here at NIOSH, Office of Extramural Programs. Thank you, Pete. Uh, this is Sarah Feltner, and I want to welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We've got two great presentations to continue the discussion that we started last year uh, in Denver when we held the Expanding Research Partnerships Conference uh, on the University of Colorado campus. So I'm pleased to uh, introduce our speakers and also remind you, as Pete mentioned, we'll take questions at the end um, and you'll be able to put those into the instant message uh, Q&A box and we'll um, be able to discuss the presentations after. So I'd like to uh, start now, without any further ado, introduce um, Andy Sakala from uh, our very own NIOSH um, uh, Mining uh, Division. And Andy, why don't you go ahead and begin, please? OK. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be here and to, uh, to be able to present to you um, Pete talk, uh, gave the title, but the work we've been doing on our video exposure monitoring system that we've uh, t entitled Helmet Cam and how we've used this to, uh, to assess respirable dust and how now it's moving into other contaminants. Before I get started, I'd like to recognize uh, my co-researcher and author on many of the papers, Dr. Emily Haas. And uh, more recently, uh, Justin Patz also has been very involved in the helmet cam research. So over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to quickly go through and talk just a little bit about silica exposure, the development of silicosis, the health effects, and what the dust standards are today, how we actually got into the, this helmet cam technology and assessment, um, and explain to you how we use it. Uh, talk a little bit about our research interventions and studies that have been performed. And through these studies, um, some engineering controls and quick fixes that we saw that uh, have been common throughout the, uh, the mining industry. And then close uh, talking about where we see the future of helmet cam going. 
So three, three um, silicosis outbreaks that I'd like to discuss that have kind of set the, uh, uh, the standard for where we are today with the regulation. So the, the first study was the Missouri lead monitor study. Uh, you could see this was performed back in 1915. And in Missouri, there were approximately 7,000 uh, lead miners. About half of those worked in uh, one particular county called Jasper County. And they were about three quarters of the workers were underground, about, uh, about one quarter or a thousand on the surface. So in this study, they examined um, 720 of, of these workers from uh, Jasper County, and they saw that, they, that about 66% of these workers were suffering from some type of pulmonary disease, and about 46% uh, uh, showed definite signs of silicosis, and uh, you can see 14 with miners' consumption in TB. Uh, this next slide shows the typical Vermont granite uh, uh, operation. You can see the haze of dust in the air, um, and uh, the first study here was uh, performed by a Dr. Hoffman in 1919. And in his study, you could see he, he examined 420 of these granite cutters and felt that 93% uh, of them, or 399, were definitely uh, being affected by silicosis. Um, five years later, in a study by a, a Dr. Russell, um, he found that, that when workers were in the trade um, at least four years, they were uh, showing at least early signs of silicosis. The two pictures on the right-hand side are from a cemetery up in Vermont, and I think they're, they're you know, very touching. Uh, matter of fact, the, the bottom um, one uh, with the, with the uh, name Brucia, this worker asked, uh, and this, both of these workers chiseled their tombstone, and in his case, he actually chiseled himself dying in his wife's arms because he knew ultimately this would be what would take his life. The last study or w effort uh, where silicosis was a major issue was uh, um, the Gully Mine Bridge Hawk Nets project. And this was a, a, a three-mile tunnel uh, driven through a mountain in southern West Virginia for a hydroelectric power uh, work. And uh, you can see within a short time after this project, there were 476 deaths associated with acute silicosis. And uh, obviously the, the ore that they were driving this tunnel through contained high levels of, of silica. So in the upper right-hand corner um, shows, you know, the many different industries throughout our country where workers are exposed to respirable crystalline silica. Um, in the bottom left, obviously silicosis um, is, a, is an issue, but also lung cancer and, and many other um, diseases uh, and disorders, uh, so uh, you know, definitely a, a, a major concern. Uh, this next slide shows the current uh, dust standard in our country. The top one for mining, uh, which is regulated by the Mine Safety and Health Administration, the standard uh, uses the equation, and this is for respirable dust, 10 divided by the cent percent silica plus two. So basically, it's a close to a 100 microgram standard. For NIOSH, we've had a recommended exposure limit for many years at 50 micrograms, and I think most people know that uh, OSHA uh, imp implemented a 50 microgram standard uh, approximately two years ago, and on the, on the bottom shows the enforcement date of how this is being implemented throughout the industry with, uh, with you know, 2021, the implementation of all engineering controls. So for the mining program for NIOSH, you can see our mission statement to eliminate mining fatalities, injuries, and illnesses through relevant research and impactful solutions. And I say a lot that our, our goal is to be honest brokers of science and technology. We go out and do the research and just let the facts speak for themselves. So how, how did we get into this uh, helmet cam assessment technology? Well, for, for our dust branch, what we do quite often is we always look at the Mine Safety and Health Administration's compliance sampling and look at miners throughout the country that are being overexposed to dust. We also, uh, in the metal non-metal uh, sector, have a very close working relationship with the industry, and a lot of the operations come to us, share uh, their own internal results, and, and you know, request 
uh, our assistance in different areas. And then the third area is we spend a lot of time in the field uh, talking directly with miners and through our own observations. And uh, one thing that we saw um, and um, was if you look on this slide here, on the left-hand side, we have four different job classifications as identified by MSHA. So laborer, mechanic, utility man, cleanup man. Um, and so if you look at these, the, we would consider these all mobile workers. And if you look at the, 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 the data is from 20, 2003 through uh, 2012, and you may say this is dated, but the reason we're showing this is because this is the information that really drove when we started into this helmet cam technology. But anyhow, for the sand and gravel industry, you can see that all the samples taken um, in this, uh, in this for contaminate code 523, between 4 and 16 percent of these samples, uh, the workers were overexposed. For stone quarries, uh, the same uh, job uh, classification codes between 5 and 11 percent overexposed, and for metal mining, between 13 and 22 percent overexposures. So obviously these mobile workers were getting uh, overexposed, but what, what, what was the cause of this exposure? So that led right into um, this video exposure monitoring system, assessment system that we've can helmet cam. So initially in the upper right hand corner, we placed a, the video camera on the worker's helmet. Um, uh, in the bottom right hand side, you can see a blue instrument um, and that's the Thermo 1500 um, a dust monitor. And so we were taking a sample on the worker every two seconds and in the center uh, is the 10 millimeter cyclone that classifies the respirable section. Then we also, you know, have the video. In this case, uh, this had a logger. And uh, on the left hand side is uh, co-worker Justin Pat. And you can see in his case, uh, we've actually gone to placing the video camera uh, on the shoulder. So when we would go out initially to do these studies, we would give the miners three different types of options on how to wear uh, the helmet cam instrumentation. The first uh, was the camel back on the very left. Um, then we gave the, the miners two different types of miner safety belts that they could wear um, or a safety vest. And um, this shows uh, what we call uh, EVADE. Uh, the original acronym stood for Enhanced Video Analysis of Dust Exposure. Um, and it, we had, uh, we designed this software which merged the video and the contaminant exposure together. So in the upper right hand corner, it's actually showing what the worker's doing. And on the bottom, um, it's showing the worker's uh, respirable dust concentration, which would change every two seconds. So right now you can see the worker is exposed to um, 179 micrograms per cubic meter. He opened this chute and, sh and you can see that's where the green line showing and here shortly uh, his exposure is even going to peak even higher. So we originally did the beta testing or validation testing on this helmet cam technology um, and you can see the dates and we really want to thank uh, these operations that worked with us to test this uh, uh, new technology. And you can see that we uh, worked with uh, approximately 120 miners and we um, had very successful results. The miners, uh, after seeing um, what their exposure was, uh, bought into it and uh, had a very positive um, uh, working relationship. Just two really quick things that we found from this, uh, it just as an example, in the, in the first operation that we went to, they operated one shift per day. So as they would shut down and the product sat for 16 hours, it would, uh, it would uh, uh, acquire moisture. And so the next morning when they started up, if they would have allowed the product to go through the screening process, it would have, through the night, it acquired moisture and it would have caused the screens to bind up. Um, so what they would do is they would have a worker go and manually set this deflector shield um, to deflect the product until new product that had been heated was coming through with the moisture content down. Well, you can see right here this worker's exposure, again, setting this deflector plate was 1,400 micrograms per cubic meter. So when this operation saw the exposure to the worker, they automated the process with two pneumatic cylinders. So one would swing it in place, the other one would lower it. They could watch the moisture content in the control room. Once it, it uh, decreased to an acceptable level, 
they would disengage the pneumatic cylinders and allow the product to flow to the screening area. A second site that we tested with um, where they were loading the flexible intermediate ball containers, and these are the one in two ton big white sacks that you see at industrial um, processing facilities. When they would change from one product size to another, they would empty the silo out into this, uh, into this hopper, and it was on a, a forklift. So they would just typically place the hopper on the ground, and you can see the, the worker was uh, loading the hopper. And so for five trials that uh, during our helmet cam evaluation at this facility, the worker's exposure for this product size was 1160 micrograms. But we realized that the greater the drop distance, the, the more uh, restful dust that's generated. So just as a trial, we said, why don't you raise the, the uh, hopper up just so you're able to still see the loading height. And so when the worker did this for seven trials, we were able to lower his exposure down to 240 micrograms just by this simple modification, which was an 80% reduction. And this was something that was very quickly validated through the helmet cam technology. So this was so successful on in our initial study that we partnered with Dr. Dr. Emily Haas uh, to, to do more of an intervention study. And we worked with five different mining companies. And you can see over 2015, 2016, Emily would uh, originally interview all the miners um, then uh, we would place the helmet cam uh, on them, and then with Emily and I would sit down and go through the footage with them. We would uh, show the health and safety personnel, uh, send the report, and then return somewhere between four and eight weeks again and, and work with the same miners again to see what changes maybe they were able to do in their work practices. There were cases where um, the companies instituted engineering controls and uh, it was very, uh, a very uh, you know, worthwhile win-win situation for um, all involved. Uh, one example that we saw during the first testing was that workers uh, changing screens or cleaning screens were, sh were seeing high exposures. So um, during this intervention study, we partnered with Badger Mining Company and Rotex Incorporated, which is a, a major screen manufacturer around the world. They're actually located in Cincinnati. And so we worked with them, and uh, Rotex actually designed a new, what they call a segmented panel screen. Typically, it took two workers, so ergonomically, this screen was much more effective than the original design. It was uh, able to be changed by one worker. And you can see from a restful dust standpoint, um, uh, the new screen design also lowered the worker's exposure uh, by 66%, so very effective ergonomically and from a dust control standpoint. One area that we saw as a common problem throughout all these studies were um, a lack of ventilation, uh, filtered ventilation in controlled areas. Um, and this just shows uh, one case in a, in a lab where uh, uh, exposures were high. Um, this shows that an operation, um, and we're going to show a quick video here. Uh, Pete's going to pull this over. And so this is actual helmet cam footage. So the worker here is in a screening tire, and he's going to be walking into what they call a splitter shack. And you'll see on the back wall a fan that isn't operating. And so when we asked them, we said, well, why isn't this fan operating as you're performing this task? They said, well, um, um, it really doesn't do anything. We have to crawl under the table to uh, plug it in. But look at how the worker's exposure increased. It's up to around 400 micrograms per cubic meter while he's performing this task. Um, so when we returned um, for the second shift at this operation, Emily actually crawled under the table and plugged the fan in. Um, go ahead, Pete, if you want to start the second video. And uh, so. Um, here, what you'll see is that um, um, the fan's running, and the worker walks in, um, and his exposure um, never increases. Um, you can see it's down between 20 and 40 micrograms. You can see the fan running, um, and his exposure uh, stays at this much lower level because they're bringing the air in from, from outside. So when we showed this footage to the workers, by the time we arrived at the facility the next day to continue our testing, they had the maintenance shift, which was graveyard, actually wire the fan into the light switch. Um, and so 
moving forward, the fan would always be running when the worker was in performing this task. So they, uh, they solved the problem um, immediately, which shows the impact that the helmet cam information had. This shows another example they, where two workers were working side by side, changing canisters in the local exhaust ventilation system. Uh, the worker on the left had a contaminated work hoodie on. Uh, the worker on the right had a, a, a clean hoodie. And the, uh, over a 12-minute segment, through the helmet cam, we saw that because of this contaminated work hoodie, the worker's exposure was three times higher than that of his co-worker. The sad thing is at this facility, they had a closed cleaning system that NIOSH designed in that same building. So this next slide shows a lot of information, and I'm not going to go through it uh, point by point. But what I do want to emphasize is that these were common um, uh, exposures that we saw at multiple facilities. And these were simple um, solutions or interventions that were implemented to lower workers' exposure. And I'll go through a few of these. Um, I also want to say that we've now gone from evade uh, one to evade two, uh, much greater versatility with this. Uh, you can use multiple videos, multiple exposure assessments. Uh, you can time uh, sync different things. Uh, Emily actually produced a video on how to perform um, the assessment with evade, and it's on YouTube and our NIOS website as posted here. And this just shows. Uh, we've also, with this of A2, we've gone from just respirable dust to uh, diesel particulate, noise, organic compounds, chemicals. Again, I said multiple video and, and logging channels, so a lot more versatility with the new software. And it's available out on our website also. Some quick uh, fix solutions. Um, one tying these intermediate ball containers, if a worker would position the caller away from them, they are able to lower their exposure by 92%, and these are some quick one-page write-ups that are available. Um, with the closed cleaning booth, uh, by using the booth, and as I mentioned at this facility, um, they actually had the closed cleaning booth in the same structure. You're able to reduce exposures up to uh, 88%. Uh, contaminated seats when there's cloth material, um, we've seen a high exposure at all the operations, so we recommend going to plastic or vinyl chairs or putting uh, vinyl or leather seat covers over any type of cloth material. Also, with housekeeping, anytime you uh, uh, hosing down is a very effective tool, but what we learned is you're better off to start with a wide spray pattern and then go to a more narrow and forceful stream. Um, with our coworkers in Cincinnati, uh, you can see all the different chemical assessments that they've used to date, so it is being expanded out into other areas. Um, uh, MSHA's tech support has adopted using this when they go out to assist mining operations. We spoke with them last year this time, and they are using it both for dust and their physical and toxic agent divisions. Um, we've been going around the country um, over the last couple years trying to get the word out, so you can see the different associations that we've worked with. And you can also see in the bottom that it's not only being used in the United States, but it's being used around the world. Um, so. What we're trying to do is get the different mining associations to adopt this and offer it to their member companies. We realize that some mining companies, if they're having issues, may not want to call the government and ask for our assistance. So it would be much more comfortable uh, contacting their association and working out any bugs with them. Where we see this going in the future is workers with multiple assessments on, on themselves, um, fed to a control room. and. Uh, and being able to adjust engineering controls to lower their workers' exposures. Um, and so uh, we see a lot, of, uh, a lot of modifications and improvements to protect workers through this technology. So in closing, um, we've tested this on over 200 miners to date. Um, we appreciate all the working relationship with the industry, and it's been a really a win-win situation. And uh, again, I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Emily Haas and Justin Patz and everyone that's uh, participated and worked with us. And uh, I thank you for the opportunity to present this technology to you today. Thank you very much, Andy, for that great uh, presentation on the exciting work that you're doing with such great partnerships built into it. We really.
appreciate learning about that. And as I mentioned, we're going to hold um, questions until the end. And so I'd like to introduce now uh, Dr. Robert Keefe, Director of the University of Idaho Experimental Forest, who's going to talk to us about logging fatality and um, injury prevention. Dr. Keefe? OK, thank you, Sarah. Just waiting for the presentation to pop up there. OK, so uh, my name is Rob Keefe. I am an associate professor of forest operations at the University of Idaho. I teach the logging systems classes in our forestry program here. And my subject area is traditionally focused on uh, research to, to quantify uh, work activities more for production efficiency purposes. And I've kind of migrated over the years into safety research. But if, it, if my language sounds funny, it's because I come from that kind of land-grant university forestry background uh, and, and moved into public health research and, and not the other way around. And, and I'm also the director of our uh, University of Idaho Experimental Forest, which is a 10,000-acre uh, working forest. It's uh, the area outlined in yellow here. And um, that is managed by students in our, in our College of Natural Resources. We uh, harvest uh, quite a bit of timber operationally each year, both with uh, professional logging contractors and also with an active student logging crew. And we prescribed burn about 150 acres every year, and uh, just last week planted uh, 60,000 uh, conifer seedlings that were grown uh, by students in our, in our research nursery here. And so I'm sort of a, a professor of practice. On top of that, we also have uh, short and long-term research funded through NSF, uh, USDA, DOE, DOD, and uh, of course NIH. And so it's kind of a fun, fun job keeping track of all the logistics on the forest. So when I first put this together, I tried to do a, a quick summary of our, the research on this project. And, and I had about 70, 60 or 70 slides. And so I've tried to pare that way down to, to stay within the time frame. And I'll, I'll move uh, fairly quickly to, to keep on track. So logging, this is a typical logging operation in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, this is cable logging. Uh, you can see a, a large, about 110 or 120 foot tall tower here, um, which we call the yarder, tower yarder. And then there's a skyline cable you can't quite make out uh, running down the hill. And um, most of our, many of our fatalities that happen on uh, cable logging operations are going to be uh, down in what we call in the rigging, which is uh, the individuals who are working down the hill out of sight from the, from the yarder operator on top, um, attaching uh, choker cables, uh, wire rope cables around uh, trees that are then going to be uh, yarded or pulled up the hill uh, to the landing up here. And so we have a number of ground workers working uh, in and around heavy equipment, uh, and uh, they're fairly low visibility operations. The fatality rate uh, in, is typically at or near the top of the list uh, for occupations. In 2015, we were at 132.7 fatalities per 100,000 FTEs, uh, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And when I was hired on the faculty uh, as an assistant professor, I toured around the Northwest to meet with uh, industry and state and federal and private forestry. And uh, one of the things that really struck me is I visited a tree farm that looked a lot like this, this one uh, in Washington. And they had had two fatalities and two near fatalities in a five-month period before when I visited. And all were on similar operations to this. All four of those were uh, ground workers on the rigging crew that uh, were involved in struck by accidents. Uh, hit by, by trees or logs that were uh, being yarded up the hill. And I thought at the time, you know, we really ought to be able to do something better with technology in this day and age to make, it, to make the equipment operators more aware of where um, ground workers uh, are on the hillside. And uh, it uh, pertains to those, those workers under the, the skyline system, and it also pertains to hand fallers who are working with chainsaws, maybe uh, a half mile away off by themselves in the woods. Uh, and there are also some other spatial uh, applications. Uh, if everyone 
had a location that could be seen uh, by other workers on the job site on a, on a phone or a tablet, uh, I thought, you know, that would, would generally make, make things safer by improving situational awareness. And the challenge is really that we're in a limited cell phone connectivity environment, and uh, there's no internet, there's no there's no Wi-Fi that we're used to in urban areas, and so um, part of it is is getting the location, and part of it is sharing that with other people in an effective and, and a fairly quick way. This is typical, more typical for Idaho, Western Washington, or uh, Eastern Washington, uh, Western Montana. It's a smaller cable yarder on the hill. Um, but we still have, you know, the, the heavy equipment working up here, three or four pieces of heavy equipment. Uh, there's a processor and a loader that are, that are out of the way here. They look like uh, large excavators swinging trees around. And then uh, three or four ground workers uh, who you'll notice you, you can't see. There's tall vegetation down low. Um, they may work in low light conditions, smoky conditions during fire season. And, and that's kind of the, the crux of the problem. So in other fields, we, um, we have, are looking, mining in particular, you know, we, we look to uh, radio frequency tag identification as a possible solution. The, the distances and the topography and, and sort of forest interaction make it challenging for those solutions to, to work well in forestry. We're at kind of an awkward distance where, you know, people may be as much as uh, half a mile or a mile apart, and um, things like Bluetooth or RFID tend not to work very well at those distances. This is uh, a, a worker effect. This, this position is affectionately called the hooker. They're hooking the choker cables on the trees uh, down the hill, and he is then going to uh, slip, trip, and fall his way uh, into a safe area called In the Clear, uh, just across the hill. This tree will then be pulled up by the yarder, and the total cycle for that tree to be pulled up and the carriage to, to come back down to get the next couple of trees is, is typically uh, two and a half minutes or so, so it happens very quickly. And so he has a short amount of time to get out of the way and get back. This is a position called the chaser, who's at the top of the hill. He's waiting for the trees to come up, and he is then going to uh, once they're dropped in front of him, he's going to run out and uh, unhook the choker cable. And this may be on um, unsure footing. They do wear uh, spike boots typically, but the slopes are 40 to oh, 70 or 80 percent or more, and so these trees may, may slip and slide a bit themselves uh, back down the hill. So how do we, uh, what is GPS, what is GNSS that we use in here? GPS is the American uh, Global Positioning System developed by the Department of Defense for military applications and then made available to the public. Many of you have used a handheld GPS like a Garmin uh, up here in the left-hand corner. Uh, that is going to uh, use some fancy math uh, and uh, a satellite constellation uh, doing trilateration to, to determine your location on the ground and tell you where you are on a map that you can see displayed. About 10 years ago, some, some devices uh, geared toward safety in remote areas were developed, like uh, spot receivers or in-reach explorers made by uh, Delorum originally that could then take that location and, and in an emergency you could press an SOS button and they would send it back through a satellite system as opposed to a cell, cell tower that is probably not available in, in remote forested areas. And it would go to, to someone off in an office somewhere. And, and that's kind of helpful, but, but not, not for all safety situations. It's kind of a limited number of safety situations that that's helpful for. And then we have things like this, this top right example and the lower left one that are more uh, military grade uh, GNSS radios. So they're, they're using the, the global positioning system and they're integrating it with a two-way radio so that uh, there's a, a GNSS receiver on here, a little antenna, and it's getting a location and then it's using the two-way radio to send it to another device so that um, without cell service, without uh, Wi-Fi, uh, someone in the woods could see uh, someone else. And these are, you know, traditionally have been used solely in the military by special forces. And, um, but the technology is, is what we were interested in uh, kind of uh, exploring and using for logging safety purposes. And then these lower, uh, kind of the lower center and the lower right cells are a newer 
technology that has really evolved very quickly over the course of our research on this grant. Uh, that, and these are, these are miniaturized radios, those little things you see with the circles around them in the lower right corner here. They're, they're miniaturized two-way radios that pair with uh, smartphones or uh, what we're working on now, pair with uh, even a, a wristwatch that has GPS in it, and, uh, and then function like the military radios. They, they're able to send uh, communications in remote areas without cell service so that you could, for example, send a text message to someone off in the, the remote north woods of Idaho or Alaska, um, even though there's no cell service, and it would be using a, a radio frequency instead of, uh, instead of the cell tower. And so uh, we have been, you know, really interested in this technology. The timing was just kind of a, a, a really great coincidence that these have evolved. Uh, a number of companies producing these just over the last two years uh, while we started on this research. And we have explored any and all of these options in here uh, and looked at the pros and cons with loggers. There are trade-offs, you can imagine, among cost, among bandwidth, how much data they can send around. Uh, among weight, uh, how heavy they are to carry, uh, among uh, user friendliness. Is it something that a uh, logger could, could, could or would want to use? So for example, some of these radios have fairly complex software and they're, they're not very easy to use. Uh, the phones tend to be uh, plug and play, you know, download an app and, and all of a sudden it works quite well. So there are these trade-offs. Our goal, our, the structure of our uh, UO1 grant that we received through NIOSH is, is kind of uh, really emphasized integrating logging contractors into the, the research process uh, at two phases. Uh, initially, we wanted to, to talk to them, uh, do some sort of qualitative surveys and interviews to, to understand their perspectives on whether this, uh, this idea seems like a, a useful one in general, uh, and also have them help us inform what kinds of hazard situations on the job site uh, it might be most useful for uh, and which things it might not be a good idea for. Uh, could potentially make things worse, for example. Uh, and, then, uh, and then in phase two, we have uh, a series of very, very carefully controlled designed experiments uh, to understand the accuracy of some of the different systems and also to evaluate some of those um, those hazard situations identified by logging contractors in a, in a controlled setting, um, and, and also do some, some operational sampling where we get out on logging operations and, and have the radios in use and, and really see how they work. We then uh, develop some draft general recommendations for, for use of this technology in logging safety applications, and then go back to the loggers again. And this is really about where we are now. We've, we've gone back to the loggers and and have their feedback on kind of our preliminary results from here and uh, the different technologies that are available and, and ask them again, you know, what do they think now? Are we still on the right track? And then, and then we wrap this up uh, next year. So that's where we are. And I'm going to focus mostly on kind of these design phase two experiments here for the next few slides. Um, what we found or what we heard from contractors in the, the initial conversations when the, when the project was uh, initiated uh, were really that uh, there are a whole bunch of situations where, where there's a, a spatial component. People near equipment, people uh, you know, underneath the log deck that may slide or roll down the hill, um, people cutting trees individually off by themselves where we may want to uh, locate them if they're hurt. And, and this list, this is only the top nine uh, <clears throat> sort of, uh, you know, situations where this might be of interest, but there are, you know, there were 20 plus on here, and they're all things that happen, you know, no, no one, one incident occurs all the time. They're, they're all things that uh, occur occasionally, which um, has the benefit really, you know, for our for this technology, the potential benefit there is really to increase a, a broad situational awareness at the at the job site of, of where people are and what they're doing, uh, making that information available to to equipment operators in particular uh, a, a little bit better. And so we heard quite a bit about a few particular situations. This picture is a hand faller. He's got a chainsaw. You can sort of see through the bushes there, but. 
Um, you know, we heard the, the faller could definitely see where the other guy that he's, that's working with him is, uh, knows how far away he is. Uh, people could notice that he's been sitting in the same spot for 15 minutes and the dot hasn't moved. We need to get over and check on him. The, the yarder operator a lot of times can't see the hookers down, the, down uh, in the lower part of the unit. So yeah, I do think GPS could be beneficial in some areas. So those were kind of things we'll focus on in, in this, the rest of this talk, or how, do, how could we use the technology to, 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 to potentially um, improve on these situations and understand if it's a good idea to use it for these purposes. So first experiment I'll talk about is a, is a designed experiment on the, on the school forest that we set up, and it was, it was to look at uh, a couple of different factors that are involved in, in this working on the ground. Uh, one is how quickly are the locations being sent to someone else? Are they being sent every two and a half seconds, every five seconds, or every ten seconds? Uh, how quickly is a, is a hand faller walking? And uh, if we had some sort of uh, safety geofence set up around, or a proximity alert, uh, sort of a hazard area around a, a hand faller cutting trees, um, how much does the, the size of that uh, affect uh, the quality of, of hazard alerts for other people at the job site? And so we did this very controlled experiment where we used a survey grade, one centimeter accuracy GPS, marked all these points along uh, this long course in the woods and had uh, other personal location devices perpendicular to that at uh, fixed locations. And we, and we walked uh, over this course repeatedly, uh, and at each point, you know, at each intersection point, we know exactly when the, the hand faller crossed the, the, the safety zone or the hazard zone, and, and then we know exactly when, based on the data, an alert was received. And we can look at the delay the difference between when they actually crossed into a hazardous area and when they're perceived to have crossed into that uh, for some you know, equipment operator looking at a computer screen or a tablet. And we wanted to understand uh, what, you know, whether, that's, uh, whether there are uh, potential interruptions or delays or issues to think about with, with using that for safety purposes. And we found pretty interesting results. There's a, very, there's a really clear geometric pattern that you would expect, but it's a little bit counterintuitive. Basically, if you walk by someone and you have this proximity alert based on the, the GPS location uh, associated with you as, you, as you brush past someone, there's a greater error than when you're working directly toward, walking directly toward them. And that alert is actually premature. It happens beforehand. And so this is a bit of a concern. Um, we, we replicated that with a simulation experiment, all coded uh, in a, an R script on a computer, and, and wanted to verify that it was, it was showing up when we based it on simulation, and, and saw the same effect here. And so that's a bit of a concern. It's something to think about. Um, there are uh, at least two companies producing now, uh, just over the last two years, produce, starting to produce some geospatial software that have safety applications using uh, using geofences around around individuals at the job site, and so this is a, a concern and something to be aware of that there's there's potentially some error associated with those alerts. So next experiment I'll talk about a little bit is is uh, that that's interesting, but let's try to understand this over the over the forested landscape. How is this going to uh, affect a variety of different operations in the woods. And so again, on the experimental forest, we went to 21 different forest stands. These are anywhere from uh, 8 to 25 acres in size, each of these little polygons you can see on the map there. And they range from bare ground that looks like a clear cut or a golf course uh, up to the old mature trees. And in all those different conditions, we uh, we monumented this this sort of a triangular plot design with a, a faller crossing a geofence uh, or an individual crossing a geofence uh, in the center of the plot and then uh, three radios out at, uh, at equal angles. And we, we quantified all the line of sight issues in between the radios, all the rocks and vegetation. And we wanted to understand uh, how much was the, the, the GNSS error affected by the tree canopy above and how much was uh, the, 
the, what was the potential for a, a missed signal due to line of sight issues in the radio frequency. So there are, there are two different things going on there and in this, these systems you have the, the GPS accuracy and then you have the radio transmission quality also. And we weren't sure if one or both matters. And we found with this very clear results, this was published in uh, PLUS ONE, that uh, the missed radio transmissions were affected by the forest characteristics, by the topography. Was it uh, concave or convex ground that they're at? Uh, and the line of sight variables that, were, that we quantified. We found also the, the GNSS accuracy itself, the, the quality of your position location was affected only by the forest characteristics. And the overall delay was uh, affected a little bit by both the forest and the topography characteristics. Okay, so that's, that's useful information to know and, and things we want to think about and sort of build into recommendations. And, and then, uh, but let's, let's get down and dirty and go to some logging operations, which, you know, make for, make for better pictures here in the presentation. And, and uh, so we went to three active logging sites in North Idaho, all uh, industrial operations. and and put radios on anything and everything, really. And uh, there's uh, Ann, one of our graduate students, putting a tablet in the yarder so that the operator can see everyone's locations. There's me uh, looking for a spot to, to put a radio that's uh, outside the carriage somewhere where it won't be, uh, where the steel won't interfere with the signals. And, and basically, we have three hazards on each operation. We have a standing dead tree down in the lower right with the yellow circle around it. Uh, that's a, what we call a snag. Uh, fixed hazard, we have uh, the, the carriage itself that runs up and down on the skyline. And that's a mobile moving hazard with a, with a fixed hazard area around it as it moves. And then the loader, the log loader, which is the other yellow circle there with a, a hazard area uh, encircling it on top of the hill. And all the ground workers, uh, at least three ground workers on each of these three logging operations, uh, had their locations bounced around to everyone else uh, in one second intervals. So a radio burst was sent every second so that everyone could see uh, locations. And what this uh, allowed us to do was, was quantify how often uh, what was the frequency of time they were within, uh, you know, an unsafe area adjacent to those hazards, uh, one or more. We also wanted to understand how much does the canopy error, uh, the forest canopy error in the GNSS signal affect uh, whether they're considered safe or unsafe. So in other words, if they're in, uh, if they're outside of a safe area and we think they're safe, what's the possibility that we might, they might actually be inside? Uh, and, and be uh, in a dangerous area. And that was done through simulation. These are the control plots used to develop the error for uh, mature forest canopy and bare ground. You can see over 30 minutes, uh, these are radios on uh, zip tied to wooden stakes over 30 minutes. In a forest canopy, those locations move around a lot on the bottom row, whereas in a clear cut on the top row, they stay very fixed. There's very, very high accuracy, um, good quality. And we encounter both of those on logging operations because we go from a mature canopy to uh, bare ground in these clear cut operations. This figure shows for the three timber sales on the, on the Y axis um, and for the three hazards across the X axis or, or across the uh, X columns, uh, how frequently were they in uh, within the unsafe zone and, and, uh, and in any uh, distance increment from those hazards in meters across the x-axis. And so the orange is in an unsafe area. And so, for example, for the snag on the top right, uh, 6,000 individual seconds, about 100 minutes were spent over three work days in uh, unsafe areas. These data are based on simulation going back and, and basically applying the error we estimated in uh, controlled conditions uh, based on the canopy or clear cut uh, to see if, they, if, we may have in, if we may incorrectly classify them as safe or unsafe based on the, the known error for a forest canopy. And we find that we do. For six of nine hazard and site combinations, uh, we, they, they may be in a, an unsafe area, but be classified as safe or vice versa. 
And so that's a concern. So we um, have presented those results uh, to loggers at our professional logging uh, education workshops in Idaho, over 300 loggers this year and over 300 loggers two years ago as well uh, with what we knew at the time and um, have generated some nice educational materials and, and um, sort of informed them about the current results and then asked them uh, to give us feedback again about whether, you know, what, what's the right way to proceed and uh, do they see value in this technology and, and overwhelmingly they have not used the technology before. These highlighted cells are just uh, summary statistics, just more than 50% is highlighted in a darker color and so most have not used this technology for safety before but if we look kind of to the improve, likelihood of improvement to safety by device and improvement by um, particular features, we get a really strong positive response. We get, you know, uh, emergency receivers, two-way radios, smartphone-based receivers, uh, all are likely to, to improve safety according to our professional loggers in, in the Inland Northwest. Uh, the only one that doesn't register there is uh, automatic updates to supervisors. We also asked whether you know they had privacy concerns, and that was faucet that was leading into that. And they they said no, they did not have uh, privacy concern issues with either coworkers or supervisors seeing locations. And most importantly for us, they carry smartphones. That's a change. That's a relatively recent change. Our demographic is. Uh, more than 70% are over 40 in Idaho, more than 50% are over 50, and, and so smartphone usage is not something to take for granted, um, but we do have a recent influx in smartphone use by, by our older demographic logging workers. So this is a, a fraction of, of the, you know, the studies that we have on this project, and we um, could only cover so much in, in the webinar, but um, it gives you a little bit of a slice of what we're working on and uh, in general there's there's wide support and interest in the use of these kinds of solutions to improve logging safety. We know for sure in our recommendations and, and received feedback uh, in support of this uh, in the, with the draft recommendations that we presented to loggers uh, that uh, geofences should be really used only for broad situational awareness and not for operational decision making with uh, equipment operations. So we, we know the accuracy is, is quite poor or varies a lot between devices and so we don't want uh, in any way equipment operators making decisions based on uh, detailed proximity alerts in the woods because the accuracy just isn't there for most of the current technology. But it is really useful for general situational awareness, and that's that's a good thing. The accuracy varies a lot, um, it's, and it's not always intuitive. Your phone may have better accuracy than some of the dedicated radios that were built uh, originally for the military, because uh, your phone gets a number of different satellite constellations, like the Russian, the Chinese, the European constellations. It, it receives more satellite information and may actually have as good or better accuracy than uh, some uh, radios that cost two to three thousand dollars more a uh, piece. Bluetooth enabled radios, those miniature radios, the one shown in the picture down here that pair with phones, uh, are are what we believe the, the most promising solution based on logger feedback, accuracy, everything we look at, uh, user friendliness, the most promising solution and what we're focusing on now. We're evaluating those operationally this year. The advantage there is that we can uh, pair them with other sensors on phones also to develop smart alerts. So instead of just a GPS location staying in one place indicating someone may be hurt, we also have accelerometers and sound meters. Uh, and the nice thing about this solution is that it's independent of heavy equipment software. It's something that uh, can work. Every, everyone can have consistent software uh, based on the phone system and, and uh, that's a good thing. Uh, the type 1 and type 2 error analysis from our operational study is, is really interesting and I think applies uh, to other spatial analysis in safety research. And when we're 
uh, that, that's something we're exploring in a, in a subsequent publication. And just in general, the success of our grant, I'll wrap up with the slide, our, so I think the success of this is really that we've, we've kept loggers and foresters and others informed throughout the process. We have multiple companies uh, of different sorts that are working on developing this technology for safety applications now. We were featured on the cover of the Timber West, the largest logging trade magazine in the, in the western U.S. up there on the right uh, last year. And that carriage that we saw in a lot of the pictures, the Eagle carriage, that company is actually producing their own system now. As of a month ago, they have it available that uh, does essentially the, the same thing that we're working on here. And they're you know, taking our information uh, into account as they work on that. With that, I, I went over a few minutes, and so I'll wrap up, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, we are running uh, short on time, and so I'd like to go right to the audience to see if anyone has any questions. You can uh, type them into the Q&A box on your screen. Um, and if you have, um, if you can identify whether the question is for Andy or for Rob, that'll help us uh, direct uh, direct the question to the right person. Any questions from the audience? Um, Pete, are you watching the? I see a question uh, yes. about slides. Yes, I am. One, uh, one is a technical question about slides being available in PowerPoint. The slides are available in PDF under the download files in the bottom right-hand corner. We are seeing some questions popping up. Uh, just give us a moment as we screen the questions. While we're waiting, let me ask both of you, um, Andy first and then Rob, since both of these um, projects were you know, so nicely applied to the particular industry and worker population that they're, they're focused on, obviously the partnerships are key. Um, any thoughts about um, you know, sort of best practices for how to get these partnerships um, Established, or uh, you know, was there was there follow-up information that you provided the the workers um, that may have been some other benefit for them for participating? Or uh, wondering if you had any briefly any thoughts about that, Andy? Let me go to you first. Um, I mean, we didn't provide the workers any like gifts or anything like that, and it was voluntary. I mean, it, no one was forced to participate, but. Um, you know, when initially we go in, we explain to them, you know, that we're there to really protect them and that, you know, we're looking at it from a dust control standpoint. So we said, you know, it's beneficial, um, you know, if you do certain tasks, if you could do those tasks while you're wearing this. Another example that we saw is from in one, in one situation, um, we saw high exposures in mobile equipment. It was in a haul truck. And, um, by the time that we had returned, um, the company had already bought not brand new haul trucks, but newer haul trucks that had a filtration and uh, pressurization system in them. And the, the miner came to us and thanked us because he said, without you guys coming and showing the exposure, we would have never, this would have never happened. So, you know, I, I, they really bought into it. They knew that we were there, you know, trying to help them. And it was a real, it was a real positive and um, situation from both the worker and from management standpoint. They appreciated us being able to pinpoint where there were elevated exposures. So, And did they get that information? I, rather than an incentive, I was thinking of, or by incentive, I was thinking of, you know, did they get any of any uh, results or, or helpful information from your uh, intervention work that might have Oh, yeah, we would, you know, when we want to them? Yeah, after the first, you know, after the first uh, visit, then we would send them a report a week or two later, and then, you know, when we returned for the second visit, then we follow up, and then there would be a follow up like six months later, also with them. So we we kept in in really good contact with them, and you know, tried to provide whatever information that they needed, suggestions, you know, would give them uh, 
papers or, or yeah. whatever we could to assist them. Great, thank you. And I see there's a question for Rob. Pete, do you want to go ahead and ask that? Sure, thank you. Yes, a question for Rob. Did you have any issues with the GPS signal quality in the north-south or the north-northeast-south-southwest drainages? Also, often there is very low coverage in these steep drainages. Yes, that's a great question, and it is something we tested for in a couple of those uh, early designed experiments, uh, and, and we did see an effect. Uh, that second study that I mentioned, there, there is a little bit of a, an aspect effect in there. Um, it's, it's relatively minor. You know, when we control everything, it's relatively minor compared to the, the canopy and kind of light line of sight impacts on uh, both, well, canopy impacts on, on the GPS quality and the line of sight impacts on the, on the radio. But it, it, it is an effect. It, it tends to be smaller than some of the other uh, forest effects. Thank you very much. And we have another question for Rob. Yarder operator is a pretty intense job for uh, job, any thought on how they would be able to access, process this positional data? Yeah, so in our field trials, we've done it with a tablet. You know, it's about a nine-inch tablet that's just on the, you know, it's on a window inside the yarder, and um, and so they're able to glance down at that. You know, they're, most equipment operators are used to seeing a, a screen at some point, and um, and in looking at their, you know, their, their computer for different uh, information as they work. So it's, it's not a dramatic change for them. Um, they, they certainly have a lot going on, but, uh, you know, we, we, we want it to be uh, an extra piece of information uh, and not, you know, the sole piece of information they're using. So we still, you know, there's, there's certainly the assumption that they still are going to be using uh, talky tutors or audio signals for safety purposes, but this this gives supplements that with a little bit more information. They can see that that uh, someone is is over across the hill, and they can maybe verify that by radio or something else before making a decision. But it's a it's a little bit more information, and they have tended to like that when we've been out with operators on the job. Well, um, I'm sorry to say that we're out of time. It's always the challenge when there's so much to present and, and talk about. Um, but we want to thank both of our presenters, um, both Andy and Rob, for this um, really exciting and interesting applied partner-based work that you're doing um, in these uh, dangerous industries. And thank all of you for joining us today. And hope you'll uh, join us again for our third webinar, which will be sometime later in the fall. And we'll um, send out uh, notices about that in advance. So thank you all very much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again uh, at a future webinar. <laughs>